But then we realize that actually your story, meaning your outrageous love story, my outrageous love story, our holy and broken hallelujah, right? Your, my outrageous love story, which is a story of value rooted in first principles and first values is chapter in verse in the universal love story. We wrote this week, right? Are you willing to play a leading role in the most unimaginably beautiful, heart-opening, heart-rending, ecstatic love story that you can imagine? I wanna, I wanna get this again. Are you willing, right, to play a leading role in the most unimaginably beautiful, heart-opening, heart-rending, ecstatic love story that you can imagine? Witnessed by all of reality, in which you are your most wondrous and amazing self shining brighter than you ever imagined possible. You are the winner of the raffle of life, right? Redeem your ticket, claim your prize, okay? So now let's, let's bring that invitation into this week's Evolutionary Love Code and let's read it together, okay? <clears throat> and let's see if we can put like five more steps together. <laughs> so I wanna start in the middle. Okay, right. what we say in the code is, right, and we're going to read it, but first I, I'm going to just kind of talk about it a little bit. What we say in the code is, and let's see if we can find this. So step one, what are the root causes of existential risk? And we're going to go through about 15 steps in 15 minutes, right, maybe a little more than 15 minutes. Right, but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna literally we wanna literally now right now get to a second simplicity where we can actually evolve the source code together. So who's ready? Who's in? Who's ready and who's in? Are we in? Are we ready? Are we ready to go? Can we take this to the next level? Are we up for it? Can we let's do it together? Okay, let's pour into each other. It's very hopeful to realize that underneath all of the explanations of the few people who are actually looking at existential risk and catastrophic risk, but underneath all the explanations, there's a couple of primary generator functions. One of them we've talked about for many years, myself, Barbara, right? Which is, right, we're living in a bad story, right? A pseudo erotic story, which is what we call success 1.0 and 2.0. Success 1.0 is pre-modern, success 2.0 is modern. At the pre-modern is rivalrous conflict between human beings and between nations and religions, right? In modernity, rivalrous conflict between every individual, a competition, right? Reality is rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics. And we've traced in great depth how that operating across every corporation, right? Every part of the tech plex, every part of industry, every family, right? Every government, every division government, right? Different nations, different religions, how that win-lose metrics right, is one of the core generator functions for existential risk itself, number one. Number two, we have two factors which are generated by this win-lose metrics, right, which creates this, this unlimited growth curve, which seeks to kind of consume, compete, profit, consume, right? We all view ourselves as separate selves, right, in this rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics. Right? That generates two things. It generates a complicated system, not a complex system. And a complicated system means a vast hyper object world in which we can't even see the pieces. They have very little obviously to do, it, do to each other. Every local node in the larger network is in its own rivalrous conflict win-lose metrics. They don't, we don't take account of the whole. Right? And so we have this complicated, therefore radically fragile system, as opposed to a complex system in which we're omni-considerate for the sake of the whole. Everything we do is omni-considerate, right? We, we consider the whole, right? The whole lives in us. That's a complex system. And we've talked a great length and we're writing a great length about these distinctions. And two, right, the second right, part of this, the second generator function, the first is the failed story of win-lose metrics, right? The second is complicated systems, which create fragility and combined with complicated systems, exponential technologies, right? Exponential technology, whether that means, right? Facebook, which destroys teenage girls as the Wall Street Journal reported all last week, right? By addicting them, right? And creating a broken person, right? Or we're talking about exponential technologies, which deliver, right? Mass destruction in ways that, right? 
the original nuclear technologies themselves couldn't even dream of, right? By rogue non-state actors, et cetera, exponential technologies, right? Out of control. Okay, so I'm not gonna go into those topics. I'm gonna go underneath. Underneath those generator functions, there's a root cause. That's what we talked about in the beginning today, right? What's the root cause? So the root cause is what we've called, anyone who will write it in the chat box, global intimacy disorder, okay? There's a global intimacy disorder. Intimacy means shared identity, right? A sense of the whole, right? A mutuality of recognition, and right? right? We can see, right? All, we can see each other. We can feel each other, mutuality of pathos, right? A shared field of value, mutuality of value, right? Plus mutuality of purpose, shared purpose, right? So a shared identity, which generates those four mutualities. When those don't exist, we have a global intimacy disorder, right? That global intimacy disorder expresses itself, right? In pseudo eros, right? Eros is intimacy. Intimacy is an expression of the field of eros. When we don't have eros, you have an empty field. So what do you have? Pseudo eros. Pseudo eros is the failed story of win-lose metrics, number one, right? Two is you have the complicated system, which there's no intimacy be between the parts. That's another expression of the global intimacy disorder, right? And then you have exponential technology, which is not, which is on a vector by itself. It keeps, it keeps exponentially self-replicating and increasing, right, its efficacy and its potential destructiveness without taking, right, the larger polis into account. So there's cancer, right, metastasizing exponential cells in the body politic and the heart of the cosmos, right? So both of these generator functions are rooted in a, and what in a global intimacy disorder, which means, but that's unbelievably hopeful, right? Once we've said this, it's taken us years to say this clearly. Once we've said this, we begin to know what we need to do. What do we need to do? We need to not just heal the global intimacy disorder, right? We need to actually evolve a new structure of intimacy that reality has never known, right? right? We need to actually restore, but not really restore because we never had that level of intimacy. We need to generate Right? A new configuration of intimacy. Now, step two, whenever there's a crisis, crisis is an evolutionary driver. We said at the outset, but step two, right? Two of step two, right? Right. Every crisis is a crisis of intimacy, right? Single cellular life is destroyed at the dawn of civilization, right? By an oxygen, being poisoned by oxygen. So single cellular life responds by generating a new configuration of intimacy, which is called multicellular life which leads precisely to you and I, to all of us here together, right? To, to the entire evolutionary chain that leads to, to human life, animal life, human life, plant life, okay? So the response to a crisis of intimacy is to generate a new configuration of intimacy at the dawn of civilization. Just one example is this multicellular life. So we're now faced with this crisis of intimacy, but it's global, it's all encompassing. It's the global civilization. Right, that is, is, is encompassed by this. So it can't be a civilization that will fail and then all sorts of other civilizations will go on. Now it's a global civilization, right, which is suffused with a global intimacy disorder, right, a crisis of intimacy, but, but we now know how to heal it. Now that we've diagnosed it, now we've diagnosed it, diagnosis is huge, it's everything. Now we know what to do. We need to now generate this new structure of intimacy, a new configuration of intimacy, like we always do in evolution. Evolution is always a crisis of intimacy, and we actually move to the next stage of evolution, by actually generating a new configuration of intimacy. What is that? So what is intimacy? Intimacy means that I bring together all these parts in a new whole. That's what a new story is, right? What a new story based on first principles and first values is, is bringing together different parts, right? All of the best leading insights of pre-modernity and the best leading edge insights of modernity and the best leading insights of post-modernity, which now clash with each other, right? America's completely polarized, Europe's completely polarized because these are all clashing with each other. They can't figure out how to be intimate with each other. When we bring the polarizations together into the field of value, into the field of eros, we generate synergy. We take the best of what's working, the best leading edge insights, and we create right, the synergy of a new story. So a new story right, rooted in first values and first principles is right, a new configuration of intimacy. So a new configuration of intimacy means when we actually begin to create global coherence because we're part of a shared story and we recognize each other in that shared story and we feel each other in that shared story, 
right? That shared story has the capacity to self-organize complicated systems into complex systems. Now get that sentence. If you missed that sentence, we missed the whole day, right? The power of a shared story of value, which we're gonna explain a little more depth in a second, a shared story of value rooted in first principles and first values has the capacity to take a vast complicated world in which there's dissociation between the parts and therefore existential and catastrophic risk and actually transform that complicated system, take those unchecked, unguided exponential technologies and actually give them direction, cohere them, right? Transform the complicated system into a complex system, which there's actually allurement between the parts because we actually share, right? We actually share the story, okay? Like, wow, can anyone feel that? Who can feel that? Who can feel that, right? We actually take, does everyone feel this? We actually take, it's beautiful. We actually take this new story and this new story, wow, right, actually becomes, right, this new story, which includes all the different parts, becomes the new source code, just like democracy became for a huge part of the world a new story. But it's a new story rooted in first principles and first values. Okay? So, so, so far, that transforms a complicated system into a complex system. And it becomes a self-organizing principle at the very heart of reality. Okay, so that's step one. Okay, now as we promised, let's go down to step two. Who's ready for step two? Okay, right, 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 right. And the new story, of course, right, right, right. New story honors all, right, right. Honors all appropriate boundaries, right. And then creates, right, a deeper integration, right, into a new whole. So here we go, step two. Who's ready for step two? Ready for step two? So step two is where we want to go. Now let's take this a a huge next step. Here's step two. So in step two, what we're saying is, is that it's not enough to have first values and first principles. Did everyone get that sentence? First principles and first values are not enough. So I'm just going to give you an example. So Habermas, Jürgen Habermas, right, who's kind of a, the kind of, he's still alive. I, I tried to call him at the university in, in Germany when I was in Holland. Right, he's like, wow. He says, could we identify, he doesn't use these words, but he's intuitively looking for first principles and first values. And for example, right, my, my beautiful friend, colleague and, and, and delightful beloved one, Ken Wilbur, right, one of his favorite philosophers as mine, right, is Habermas. So Habermas is looking for first principles and first values. Then you have people like, let's say, Marilyn Evelyn, Mary Evelyn Tucker or Brian Swim, who are looking to tell a universe story. Okay, now stay close, stay close. But Habermas refuses to engage anything like a story. He wants, though he doesn't call them that, he wants principles. The universe story people, they want to mythopoetically see that there's this story but they mean it mythopoetically. They're trying to impose, right? There's this story happening, right? But there's no first principles and first values in the story because they can't claim first principles and first values in any real way because they're living in a postmodern context. Does everyone get that? Neither of those work, okay? And let's see if we can just kind of catch this for a second. And it's very, when you catch it, it's almost right, insanely obvious. In order to create the allurement, right, between parts, the inherent allurement, which self-organizing reality to a larger whole, you need both a story, not just a story, that you can't just have a story. You need a story of value, meaning it's rooted in intrinsic value, one, and those values have to be Intrinsic, first principles and first values of cosmos. So you need a story of value rooted in first principles and first values. A new story is not enough, right? Post-modernity, like our friend Yuval Harari says, yeah, let's make up a new story. We know it's going to be a fiction, his word. We know it's going to be a, a figment of our imagination, his word. We know it's just going to be a social construction of reality, his word. All adopted, for example, by the kind of postmodern mindset of the universe story people, right? So... So let's, let's make a new story up. 
but that doesn't work. Right? Making a new story up doesn't work. The new story has got to be rooted in intrinsic values of Cosmos. Now to show how we get to those intrinsic values, that's going to be one of our big projects this year. We began that project last year. How do we actually crack values and actually show that we can articulate first principles and first values? That's going to be one of our major intentions as One Mountain this year. Let's put that aside for a second. Imagine the difference for a second between watching a documentary right, and, and watching a movie. So how do you feel when you watch a documentary? I mean, not bad, right? Documentaries are good. We like documentaries. But you don't have that feeling of excitement when you're about to watch a new movie, which is why if you look at the statistics of viewership on even the best documentary, it doesn't even vaguely approach right, the statistics of people who are watching a great movie. Why? Right? What, 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 what happens in movie, which is a modern art form? What is Netflix providing today? Right? And Netflix has a lot of shadow, but what's it, what's it trying to speak into the need for story? So you watch a series and it, and, it, and it goes on and on and on and you get absorbed in the story and get absorbed in the characters and you're, you're transported, right? There's, an, there's a yearning for story, right? Story itself is not an accident, right? Story itself is part of the, the actual source code structure of cosmos itself. This is why story allures. I'll give you another example. So let's say a philanthropy says, We've got, you know, 40,000 children, right, starving in Ethiopia. That's a principle, starving children. The response is tragically very little. But then when you talk about, right, nine-year-old Sally, right, right, who is, right, in Ethiopia, and you see her mother, and you see her story, and you see, right, and all of a sudden, there's this outpouring. Why? It's the difference between a movie and a documentary between first principles and story, story allures, right? Story arouses, okay? Story arouses. Can you feel that, friends? But story doesn't arouse unless, it doesn't allure unless, next sentence, unless it's rooted in first principles and first value. Value itself arouses our appetite. Whitehead talks about the appetition of cosmos for the good, the true, and the bad, the beautiful. When there's a true value of the good, the true, and the beautiful, we're allured to that value. So value arouses will. Value arouses political will. And story organizes will, arouses will, allures us. If you put story and value together, and value is not just a made up value, it's an intrinsic value. It's a first principle and first value of cosmos. Then we actually have a chance of changing reality, okay? So, so you need first principles and first values, number one, embedded in the structure of story, okay? That's an entirely new formulation, right? And it's, it's, it seems simple, but it's wildly important. Habermas's principles won't get us there. And my colleague Brian's universe story won't get us there, right? We need a story of value, but not just mytho-poetic value, a value that we're imposing, we're pretending it's there, it's our postmodern creation. No, we need to actually identify, and how we identify that in that big story of value we talked about somewhat last year, we're gonna go into much more depth this year, right? That is, if you remember, go back to episode four of the Star Wars series, right, which is the first movie, but episode four, when Luke Skywalker, young Mark Hamill is trying to take down the Death Star, and they're only going to take down the Death Star if you can get a direct hit. Direct hit. You need a direct hit because you can't. The Death Star is culture. The Death Star is evolving the source code. The Death Star is existential risk and catastrophic risk. How do you take down the Death Star? You need a direct hit. How do you get a direct hit? You've got to actually clarify the meta narrative. You've got to clarify the meta story so precisely. So here's our clarification. This is a huge clarification, right? We're actually, we're, we're dialing it. If you imagine, if you imagine what we're doing now is imagine we're dialing a lock on a safe and you can actually hear, it's like the end of the movie, it's all silent and you can hear click, 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 right? Who can hear the clicking? Can anyone hear the clicking? Can anyone hear the clicking? Who can hear the clicking, right? Anyone, anyone, can you hear the clicking? Right, click, 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 right? Right, it's, we need a story of value rooted in 
intrinsic value, first principles and first values. So all of the talk of the new story actually won't get us there, right? So like my friend, right, Nadav, who writes the book, The Global Revolt, and the last chapter is called The New Story, but he says, but there's no intrinsic values. So it's a made up story. So it becomes a governance story. It becomes an infrastructure story. Won't work. But why? Why won't it work? Right? Not because I'm, because the intrinsic structure of reality is story. Right? The way the mystics called it, said it, they said, God loves stories. The lineage masters said, God loves stories. But what we mean by God loves stories is the intrinsic structure of reality is story. Right? We think in stories. There's a reason the Bhagavad Gita is a story and the Torah is a story. Right? There's a reason that Jesus' Last Supper was a Passover Seder in which the first principle of freedom was told in the story of the Exodus, which is the story of leaving Egypt. Do you get that? If, if we would teach the first principle of freedom, it would get us nowhere, right? The subversive story of the Exodus arouses, right, the African-American slaves, right, to say, let my people go. Let my people go, right? The principle of freedom won't do it. And on the other hand, just a story, not rooted in the first principle and value of freedom and showing that freedom is an intrinsic value of cosmos, which allures us. When we see George Floyd killed, right? We know there's been a violation of value. Then when we begin to experience George Floyd's story, we begin to feel that that violation of value Right, right, is embedded in the story of life. And, and then, even though we're in the middle of COVID, the entire liberal community that is appropriately, right, in many ways, most resonant with the mandate for masks and social distancing, right, and vaccines, and in many beautiful, correct, and gorgeous ways, that entire community at the height of COVID breaks out into the streets all over the world, forget about social distancing, right, and correctly so, because Black Lives Matter. And so we're going to explode in a particular way because we have to, because we've seen a violation of value, right? Right, rooted, embedded in the story, right? So the way to create global coherence, right? And to create, right, a new global intimacy that allows us to coordinate, right? And to actually address existential and catastrophic risk is to address the root cause of the generator functions, right? Are you as excited as I am? Who's excited? I'm excited. Right. Can we feel this now? Let's feel this. Let's feel this. Stay in. Right. Stay. Let's see if we can stay in all the way, all the way, all the way to stay in. Like, wow. Can we feel that? So let's just go one last step. OK, we're just beginning this. This is just the beginning of the beginning. We're going to take this the next week to the next level. We're going to go look at our friend, right, Mr. Reback, right, in 2009 Eurovision, who tells a story called Fairy Tale. And we're going to look at that story and we're going to we're going to go and we're going to unpack, right, this notion of story. Now, here's the thing. The story, I'm gonna to go to the next step. I'm gonna just go two more steps. The story has gotta be an outrageous love story, right? In other words, it's not enough for it to be a story, right? The word story and the word love go together. Isn't that true? Love story, but those words go together. Love story, those go together. It's not enough to have just a meta theoretic political story. It's got to be a love story, whether it's love of country or love of other or love of family or love of the divine or love of nature or love of Gaia. It's a love story. So let's look at our code. Let's look at our code. Let's see if we can look, look what we did today. Let's look at our code. Let's put the code in the chat box if we can. It's gorgeous, right? It's gorgeous, right? And try, it's very easy to kind of, it's very easy, I'm going to ask, right? Very easy to get stuck. Try to kind of let the stuck go and step in, okay? Right? Let's look at this week's evolutionary code that David resonated. Reality is not merely a fact. Reality is a story. Reality is not an ordinary story. Reality is a love story. Reality is not an ordinary love story. Reality is an evolutionary love story. It's an outrageous love story. Right? But then we realize that actually your story, meaning your outrageous love story, my outrageous love story, our holy and broken hallelujah, right? Your, my outrageous love story which is a story of value rooted in first principles and first values is chapter in verse in the universal love story. So your story, your personal story, your personal incarnation of the infinity of intimacy in your life, your holy and broken hallelujah, which is why we use that chant of Leonard Cohen right, to do our prayer. 
because it's it's a story. Now, there's a, there's a billion love songs in the world and they're all about love stories, right? Most music in the world is about love and it's about love stories, right? Most stories in the world are love stories, one form or the other. So it's not just that reality is a story. It's not just that it, as my friend Howard Bloom and I like to say to each other and we're writing, it's not just that we live in an amorous cosmos. Let's be precise. It's not just an amorous cosmos. It is an amorous cosmos, but it's, it's also the universe colon a love story, right? Evolution is, let's get the sentence, evolution is the love story of the universe. And my personal evolutionary story is chapter and verse in the universal love story. Now stay close. And that realization that reality is a story is itself a great revelation. We didn't know that before. Science rejected that idea. Science, right, in its early dogmatic materialism said, no, it's just facts. There is no storyline. And religion said, no, the story here doesn't really matter. We actually have to move beyond this world to the next world. So it, it's only a kind of, it's a kind of fundamentally, it's a test story to get you to the real story, which is the next world. And we're saying, no, 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 this, world's, this world matters. It has infinite dignity. And our stories here have infinite dignity and our needs have infinite dignity. Right? And evolution is love in action in response to the needs of our personal and collective stories. Wow. Right? So what do we begin to understand? We're going to close here. Let's add two more steps, two huge steps. So we begin to understand that the realization that reality is organized by stories of value rooted in first principles and first values, that itself is an evolution of love. That itself is an evolution of the source code, right? Number one. Number two, we realize, number two, that when we awaken to that truth, we realize the universe is alive in us, right? I am evolution. I am the universe. I am the voice of the universe. I am evolution speaking, right? All the previous stages of evolution actually live in me, right? I am evolution in person, what am I doing as the universe in person? I'm telling the story. So that's two. We are the universe's storytellers. That's two. But here's the last piece. And with this, we finish. And it's gorgeous. We're not just the storytellers of the universe. If we just open our hearts, right? And I want to try and say this without crying because it's, it's so beautiful. And it's so, it's the most significant realization we can have in our enlightenment and our collective enlightenment, okay? And our collective intelligence, so let's just kind of say it like this, right? The story's incomplete. It's an unfinished story. We're not just the storytellers of the universe. We are charged with writing the next chapters in the story. And for the first time in human history, the story will close, it will end, and the ending will be tragic, if we don't find our way through and actually write the next chapter and up level and change the vector of the story. You know, the, 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 the poet Seamus Haney, or Heaney is a, won a Nobel prize. He's a very beautiful poet. Um, he won the, uh, an Irish poet. He writes something really beautiful. He says, never forget that you were born knowing, right? We know things, the story lives in us. We call that anthroontology. Never forget that you were born knowing that this fluke, single, huge, cross-indexed, thermodynamic experiment of a story that the world has been inventing to tell itself at bedtime is still an embryo. It's not even the outline of a synopsis of notes towards a rough draft yet, by the plot sometime. So Haney didn't get all of it, right? Haney was, was enculturated in postmodernism. He didn't get the notion of an intrinsic story to cosmos, but he got something really important. He got, he says, by the plot line sometime, right? The story is in play. It's not even the outline of a synopsis of notes towards a rough draft yet, by the plot sometime. Right, this thermodynamic story that we live in right, is turning to us and saying to us, write me. I need you desperately to write the next chapter. 
Don't let the chapter be written as a failed win-lose metric story that generates complicated systems with exponential technologies. Actually allow the principle of a story of value rooted in first principles and first values. Now, what's the first step to doing that? Right? Understand that your story, that my story, are chapter and verse in the universal love story. And whenever I go back to the limited parameters of only my own story, to my own success, my own egoic moves, my own separate self, I ultimately wind up in despair. I ultimately break down. I ultimately wind up massively depressed. I ultimately wind up in some form of mental breakdown because I'm in denial of my true nature. And my true nature is not just I am. My true nature is I'm not just the storyteller of the universe. And I'm the person charged with writing the next chapter in the universe story. And we are together, this band of outrageous lovers, we're uniquely charged to do that. That's ours to do. Right? We're awake to it for some reason. That's why we're here together.